Today's video is an analysis and theory on the play Lockdown by playwriter Douglas Craven. On the surface, there might not be that much to analyze per se, other than that ending. The police are outside. That doesn't sound like something that would happen during a drill. They already have the whole school on lockdown. And apparently the police are outside. So a fire alarm on top of all of that seems kind of suspicious. They never hear any um, gunfire. There's never any like loud noises. There's nothing. Now, why would a threat knock at the door? If you look at them closely, you start to see some strange things start to unravel. Things about Adam, the location of the play, and the timing of the play's release. And some of these things might seem far-fetched, but just stick with me. I think I'm onto something. Hey guys, welcome to part two of the lockdown theory. If you haven't seen part one, you're going to be very confused. So be sure to go watch that. Links in description and probably around here. <laughs> so anyway, as previously mentioned, the main three topics of today's video will be uh, the location of the play, Adam, and the release of the play. We're going to tie those together and sort of get maybe a, maybe... A deeper meaning. So first we're gonna look at the real world location of the play just because that sort of is the basis of everything else this theory builds off of. So let's start there shall we? So first things first, where is this thing even set? Well the best place to start is by checking where Douglas Craven himself currently lives. According to playscripts.com it says he lives in white... <laughs> These Canadians! <laughs> says he lives in Whitby, Ontario, which for reference is right here. Pretty close to New York, actually. Keep that in mind. So that doesn't really narrow anything down. I mean, just because he lives in Canada doesn't mean that it has to be set in Canada, per se. It could easily just be set in Australia. We would never know. However, we can do a little bit of research on our own and sort of try to figure out the vague area of where Dearborn would be set in real life. I think... After doing hours and hours and hours of research, I finally figured out where Dearborn is. So you want to know how I found it? Here's how. So I went to www.google.com-maps, and I went, I went to the search bar, and I typed in Dearborn. No actual place called Dearborn exists at first glance. However, what does come up is Dearborn Insurance Agency which is located, wouldn't you know it, right next to where our man Douglas Craven lives. Coincidence? Yeah, I mean, that's that would be fair. It's probably a coincidence. But, I mean, look at how close that is to where he lives. Is it really that much of a stretch to say that he maybe had a job in that area and every day he passed that building and after a while he was just like, Dearborn. Maybe it is a little bit of a stretch, but there is this one part of the play I would like to bring up. So this right here is going to confirm the location. Here's why. One part in the play, the students all try to have a decent conversation, sort of distracting themselves from the impending doom that awaits them. At one point, Chelsea decides to go on our I am very random and just randomly says, you know what I heard? If you feed a bird rice, it explodes. They just sort of argue whether or not the bird would actually explode if you fed it rice. And then Mark says something interesting that you might miss if you don't read carefully. There's no way a bird would explode from just rice. Think about it. In the city, there's lots of pigeons, right? Well, in Chinatown, there's a lot of rice. So if you're right, there should be about 600 explosions downtown every lunch hour. Chinatown? Why? I thought this was set in Canada. Well, if you think about the location that I proposed the play is set in, and you look at where Chinatown is, relatively, it is very close to each other. It's an hour and a half flight, and it would land directly to the JFK International H Airport, which is only, again, like 10 minutes away from Chinatown. It's even a direct flight. He wouldn't even have to get off or change or anything. Is it really that much of a stretch to say that Mark hasn't been there a couple of times? It's only an hour and a half away by plane. So, Play Lockdown is set in Toronto, Canada. 
And that is a fact. Hey guys, I decided I would dress to match my new haircut. So now we're going to take a closer look at the character Adam, his overall character arc, his thematic relation to the overarching storyline of the play. Ooh, that was a big sentence. Ooh. You guys have no idea how much I've had to cut out of this video. I, I'm so proud that I actually managed to spit out a concise sentence for once. So, examining Adam. So since the very beginning of the play, Adam's always been argumentative, he wants to do things his way. And while that might just be a plot device to sort of show conflict between the students, I think if you look closer at his character, then you realize, hey, this, this guy is important. Now what exactly do I mean? Well, let's take a look. So since the beginning of the play, Adam always had this one way of sort of separating his character from all the others which was he had this lighter that he would kept. I can't speak English. My face when recording a YouTube video isn't as fun on the third day than it was the first. That That's the face. So Adam, since the beginning of the play, has had this way of separating himself from the other characters, not just through his dialogue, but through a physical thing that he kept doing. Throughout the play, he had this lighter that he repeatedly would fiddle with, or just... Whatever you do with a lighter, I wouldn't know. I, I'm not about that life. There's this one point in the play when all the characters are just waiting for something to happen so that they can progress with the plot, I guess. Anyway, Mark asks Adam if he can see his lighter, since they have nothing better to do. So Adam tells Mark that he got the lighter from his grandfather when he visited Holland last summer. So then Mark realizes there's some stuff written on the lighter, and he asks Adam, Hey, what, what does this stuff mean? And then Mark attempts to read the Dutch writing, which I'm also going to attempt to do. Cracked, gut, nard, a jagger. And then Adam's like, nah fam, it's not that at all, it's just Kracht gaat naar de jager. And then Mark's like, oh cool, that's pretty edgy and quirky, what does it mean? So then Adam replies, you have to be strong to win. And then he goes, something like that, I probably should have paid more attention when he told me. Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Obviously, I cross-referenced everything. I didn't just solely rely on Google Translate, but it everything was the same wherever I looked at it, so... First, I typed in what he says it means to see if it's just the same thing. So I typed in, you have to be strong to win into English and Dutch. It's not even close. It's je moet sterk zin om te winnen. So then I decided, hey, well, what does the Dutch actually mean? If he clearly doesn't know what it means, what does it actually mean? So I typed it in to Google Translate and I entered the Dutch. And oh boy, it gave me some spicy output. It literally translated to... Krat goes to the hunter. It translated the same thing on Deep L as well, although it gave me an alternative of Krat is going to the prowler. Now that sounds a lot edgier, I like that more. So anyway, I was obviously pretty confused by that since you have to be strong to win and Krat goes to the prowler. Kind of different translations. <laughs> I, I think some stuff got seriously lost there. I was also confused by, well, what is Krat? And as far as I could find, that's not a word in Dutch, until I figured out. It is a last name. I'm assuming what this means is that Adam's last name is Krat, and the motto actually means, like, Krat the family goes to the hunter. Goes to the hunter. That's an interesting way to put it, considering they're being hunted. Hunted? I don't know why I expect anyone to take me seriously while I'm wearing this. So clearly that's no mistake. So thinking about Adam's character, the entire play, all he's wanted to do is leave, possibly to go face the intruder. 
So that also adds another layer of Adam wanting to leave the classroom not just to escape or to get to safety, but that sort of adds the layer of Adam wants to pursue the person that is intruding the school. So as for the overarching like timeline of the actual events in the play, does it really change much? No, because we see he doesn't actually ever leave. But it does change the events that happen in the classroom. Because, if you think about it, the entire play isn't being written, per se, for the audience to instantly think about, Oh, what happened at the outside the classroom? No, the audience is just thinking, Oh, well, I care about the people in the classroom. What's happening with them? So, in a way, that would make Adam the main character of this play. Because, think about it, the author includes all these little things about Adam more than anyone else. And especially with this, like, hint that his entire arc is about wanting to leave so he can go hunt this person down. So yeah, the main character of the play is Adam, and that is a fact. I decided I would look more like a clown if I wore this than an actual clown costume. I feel smart wearing this. This is my smart hat. I, feel, I can feel the brain cells like just really going overtime when I'm wearing this thing. So I'm gonna try to wrap things up with this little section as it has been four days of recording and I'm a bit burned out on this project. I'm so excited to be here today. <laughs> this is so bad. Uh, and it's like 90 degrees, so I'm gonna die wearing this. So we're gonna try to wrap things up today, mainly by looking at the play's release and tying it all together, and maybe even a little surprise there at the end. So last thing that we can really talk about is when was this play released? It's important to remember that we're viewing this play through our 2019 lenses, you know? So playscripts.com actually doesn't really give a release date, but it does give a list of like basically every performance of it. So if you look at the production history and you sort by most recent and then go to the very last page, then you see that the very first performance was December 6, 2006. And it was in Mr. Craven's hometown of Whitby. So I would say that's probably pretty safe to say that's the first performance. Pretty interesting how it's still relevant in 2019, you know? It's kind of a bad thing now that you think about it. So keeping in mind that it was released in 2006, and keeping in mind we sort of know a vague area of where the play is set, we can kind of look and try to figure out maybe if this was based on a true event. So if you go on Wikipedia, it has a list of every th important event that happened in 2006 in that area. So nothing really stood out as similar to the events of the play other than June 2nd. I'll read the, what it says on Wikipedia right now. June 2nd, terrorism plot. More than 400 police officers raid homes in Toronto and Missayuga, Ontario and arrest 15 people, five men and five youths, part of a terrorist cell. I don't, I don't need to read all that. But the point is, 400 officers raid homes in that area on the grounds of a terrorist plot and arrested 15 people. And all that happened the year of the play's release, six months before the play's release. Now you may be thinking, that has nothing to do with a school or anything. Well, you're right. But if you read through the script carefully, you'll notice not once does anyone call the intruder a sh They call them a terrorist. And whenever they hint, well, who could it be? They always, without fail, say terrorist, which always stood out to me. Why would they say terrorist instead of anything else? But if you keep this in mind, that this massive arrest had just happened, and this is taking place in the same area and in the same time period, then that easily explains why they would instantly think that. Because if you reread it, that's all they say. They don't think it's anything other than that. Keeping that in mind, let's re-examine the ninth grader. As previously mentioned, I made an extreme claim in part one. The ninth grade girl is in fact the daughter of a terrorist organization, which I still stand behind, but as I did more and more research, it 
doesn't really stand up that well, but I'm still gonna explain it, okay? If you read carefully the ninth grade girl's actions in the script, then you can see she's reacting more than any other character in the play. She's terrified. So while that could easily be explained away by just saying, oh, well, she's the youngest, she's gonna be the most scared, which is true, but I don't really want to think that. I want this to be outrageous and an insane claim. So I am going to say that she not only knew of the terrorism plot from June 2nd, I also think that she was in direct relation to one of the people that the officers missed. And that person that the officers missed on June 2nd is indeed the person that's inside the school. So while there's no like solid evidence to support this claim, given the limited information that we have about this universe and this scenario, and looking at the evidence I've already found, this is the only thing that we the audience could possibly discover from the author's information to us. While he could have just easily made everything up, this is set in Australia, and it's actually just a koala that wandered in, but it was a rabid koala, so they put the school on lockdown, and that's the whole play. We would never know. That could be 100% what he was thinking when he wrote that. We would never know. But given what he has written, I would say that this is the most solid claim that we can figure out for what the play Lockdown is about. I love how I'm referring to the script like it's the Bible or something. And then Mark spoketh thus. You ever see that movie where a bird is flying by and it gets hit by a baseball? Thus the script hath wrote. <laughs> so that is the most accurate analyzation and timeline of events that I can possibly give given the information on the play Lockdown. And while I easily admit that a lot of the things I've said are sort of probably not true, it is definitely important to note that some of the things you can't deny, like the fake Dutch translation and the police are outside thing. So what was the point of making a theory that even I don't believe in? Well, at the end of the day, you can take any good piece of literature, any good piece of fiction, and if you dig deep enough into it, then you're gonna find stuff that pops up and you can put two and two together when actually it wasn't even two and two at all. It was three and seven. But somehow you got two and two and you put them together to get four when actually it was ten the whole time. So sometimes it's better just to leave things as it is. But if you're a film theorist like me, then you won't let things stay that way. You gotta make sure you get the fun out of anything you see, okay? If you see a pigeon, then you gotta look at him in the eye and say, if you eat rice, you will explode. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I'm just so done with this video. So thanks for sticking this long with this lockdown theory. I realized this was sort of a different thing, but that's about all the time we have and I don't really have anything else to say, but what's this? Huh? What? Oh, you guys, I just got word that we got an exclusive interview with a cast member. All right, guys, time to confirm what I've already discovered. Hello? Hello? Is this Mark from Dearborn High? Uh, hello, is, is this Matt Pat from Game Theory? The Game Theorist channel on YouTube.com? Uh, it's such an honor to have this exclusive interview with you, Mark from Dearborn High. Are you Don't a... ever call me again. <laughs> Don't ever speak to my daughter again. <laughs> Is it okay if I ask you a few questions about the performance? Sure, Matt Pat from the Game Theorists at ScrewAttack.com. <laughs> so, first question. What was it like being in such a tense environment with people like Adam? Ooh, well, uh, he's, he's kind of a, uh, a reckless character, you could say. Um, it was a... His personality did not suit the stressful environment. So in your in your head canon, as the as the weebs say, where was Dearborn set in your mind? It's in Canada, fool. Yeah, but where? Uh Canada, Nebraska. Uh 
Uh, I realize your schedule is very busy, and I apologize for keeping you for as long as I have, but... Did you ever discover whether or not a pigeon will explode when you feed it rice? Uh, yes, I did. All the pigeons in my town, they all did. Every last one of them? Yes, sir. We had to repeat the experiment to make sure uh, it, you know, it was uh, proven. You know, you know, you learn the stuff in science. Yeah, you're right, you're right. They're all dead. They're all dead. Oh, hello? Hello? Uh, uh, one more thing about Adam. Uh, I forgot to mention, he's the purple guy from FNAF. 